Hi again, everyone. Welcome to the Discovery Lab series. Today we have Stefan Harting with us, a very special mm -hmm. guest, a zoologist and an ecologist, and is currently working um, with B4C, the Belimba uh, Creek Catchment Coordinating Committee in Land Care Management. So without further ado, I introduce you to Stefan. Hi, Stefan. How are you going? Hello, Sandra. Well, and yourself? Yes, very good, because I'm very happy because I love hearing about owls. So today we'll be speaking about owls again, on barn owls this time. But before we do that, I would love to find out about your background, because you have some interesting background, because you come from South Africa. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in science, in ecology, in zoology, and also your background as a kid as to what got you started. Oh, wow. How was about... The story my, my family told me, I was four years old and I went and visited my aunt and she had canaries. And I went to her and I, that's what they told me. And I went to her and I said, do you know that your canaries have babies that hatch? And she said, no, how are they? they're still on egg. She said, no, they, I've got, they've got babies. And she said, how do you know? I said, no, they told me. And since then, my whole family knows that I talk to animals. <laughs> so... And I've always talked to animals. I even had its school special permission to go home in, in breaks, in lunch breaks, to go and feed all the baby birds around me. So it's just been my whole life a passion. And I always say that, thankfully, my head is put up on a funny angle of my body, so they always look up. And, you know, my eyes just go like a chameleon, trying to absorb, you know, absorb and, and observe as much as possible. So that's where it came through and then I studied zoology and I went to obviously my passion studied at the University of Victoria in South Africa and um, did a zoology and then an honours and a ma uh, master's in wildlife management and after that I had a chance to go to Uganda and work with chimpanzees for a year so and then I've travelled all over and um, so I had a good life and then I lectured for 11 years at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, which is a truly comprehensive university in the sense that we try and, you know, universities tend to put things in boxes. So we try to move out of these silos. So we were fortunate that we have forestry, we have agriculture, we have accounting, we've got all these and, and, and different departments, which in the traditional university doesn't really communicate with each other. But we would work with colleagues from different departments and find solutions to issues and problems. And, and that's where it started. But I always looked after owls. So if you Google my name, it comes up as the Owl Whisperer. And how that came is the newspaper run a story that I would have owls and look after the spotted eagle owls, which is very common in South Africa. And I had this pair that fostered all other babies. And um, the most I had was 27 in one time, but all living in my garden. So when the night falls, when the, the sun gets ready for setting, I would just do a whistle. And these owls would pull the line up on my wall, garden wall. And each one would get his chicken head, 27 of them, and they'd all fly off. But on the other side, on the roadside, you would have a line of photographers. And that ended up in newspaper with these line of photographers with all these owls on a wall. And I was called the owl whisperer. My house was called the owl house. So <laughs> that's where it came from. But at university, we have a problem with these owls because they're very common. Wherever you have wildlife living with, with, with humans and we use rat poison or poison for, for rodents, they, they get in contact with them. And I started the Nest Box project in South Africa at the university where we got um, people that was disabled, didn't have a job, and we got them to make these boxes for us, owl boxes. And what was so nice about these boxes is the owls do well without the box because these are very, you know, these owls are really everywhere. And they, they're impressive. They're really big spotted eagle owls. If anybody wants to Google it, they're very impressive. But the box, if you put a box up, they would take it. But the issue for me was when the people have the owl breeding in their box, the children would go on their little DMXs around the block and they would knock on every door and say, do not kill my owls. It became theirs. And that was it. So the box was just a message to get conservation message. And that worked really well. And when I came here, I found that I thought rat poison was used indiscriminately in South Africa. And I was really shocked when I came here and I realized how this country is using rat poison. It is unbelievable how high usage of roadicides is used in this country. Everywhere. You know, bait stations constantly um, 
companies, there's so many, and I'm not wishing it, but you know, that, it's a sad part. It's just, I think it comes from an era where, where chemicals was a quick solution for everything. You know, um, herbicides, pesticides, we came out of that era, but I think we um, believe we're entering an era now that we realize those things have knock-on effects and really detrimental to the environment. And and that's where I started to, to start bringing the message back in again. And it's not new. I mean, this is used all over the world. It's just weird that it's not really used in, in Australia that much. So that's where my message started with the Barn Owl Project here. And, and the effect of my people are aware of the effect of, of rat poison. Isn't there right now a um, campaign happening? I think by BirdLife, I don't know, maybe it's BirdLife Australia, I'm not sure, but that's where I got it from, where that we're trying to stop this next generation poison, which is really bioaccumulative. And um, uh, I think it's a anticoagulant from my understanding. Is that correct? There's some poison that shouldn't be used on the shelves, but it is, and we can just get it whereas other countries have said no and we're not allowed to use it as in domestically. You see, I always, well, I get people because I do these talks and people phone me and say, oh, well, I've got this rat poison, it says that that's safe. I said, okay, open the pamphlet inside. What does it say? Can you eat it? And they say, no. I said, what will happen if you eat it? And I'll probably get sick. I said, so it's not a rat poison, it's just poison. Anything that eats it, it gets sick. So, it's brilliant marketing and you know um the problem is just a bit of background on how these rat poisons work it was called the first poison they used it's, an, it's called warfarin it's similar to warfarin so it, it stops the black clotting but it takes a couple of days for it to build up into the body it destroys the vitamin k and then the rodent or whatever eats it basically starts bleeding internally um through the nose through the ear and you die from internal hemorrhage um, which they say is pretty painless, and I don't know why. Um, but the issue was that the rats started building um, resistance to this, and that was what's called first-generation poison. And it's low dose, and it's not that toxic, so the rats could have taken multiple feeds of this. But they build up a resistance to it, and then the they started what they call the second-generation. Um, rat poison and all it is it's called super warfarin so it's, it's a, a far more toxic poison and the rat only needs to have one dose of it um, to kill it which sounds like oh that's the best way of doing it and it's less toxic the problem is rats are extremely intelligent you know in my talk that you attended i i used and i said the difference between rats and humans is rats don't play the lotto otherwise we're all the same but they are really intelligent so rats will not if one rat eats rat poison and it shows symptoms all the other rats will not touch it they will not touch that poison so the companies deliberately put the poison in that it takes them three to sometimes five six days before they die so that all your rats tend to eat it the downside of this is that this strong second generation poison on day one he consumes enough to kill him but it only kills him on day six which means he eats on day two he eats on day three he eats on day four Day five, he gets sick. So he probably has three to four times the lethal dose in his system. And that's lethal. And we found one rat will wipe out the whole barn of the popular nest box. If that bits of that rat is fed to every chick, they will die from it. And that's where the downside is. And it's, it's, I mean, it's clever marketing. The problem is you buy these off the shelf and people don't realize there's this knock on effect. Um, the one that I, published in uh, the scientific articles that was published in Western Australia, the bubuk owl. Now, the bubuk owl is a generalist. He eats basically anything. It's the most common owl in Australia. Um, and they caught them and did blood tests on them. And 72% of them all had extreme high dose of rat poison in their livers. That's an owl that doesn't even specialize in rodents. So if you take it to a specialized hunter, like a barn owl that really eats almost nothing else but rodents, the, the, the chance of them surviving this, this rat poison is almost zero. Um, we have got some new publications out last year in South Africa, in Cape Town, we, because they know, because in Cape Town, um, we have the wine farm. So again, I say rats are like humans, they love wine just like we do. So they use rat poison to prevent that. And they tested all the native wildlife that traditionally feed on rats. Those are owls, uh, caracal, which is a couple of links, um, genets, which is a type of wild cat. So there are five or six species of predators that hunt 
native predators that hunt rodents in, in South Africa. And they all tested positive. As soon as you come close to your residential area, they all had high doses of it. But what was surprising, the Cape Crawlers otter had just as high dose in the in their system. And that's an aquatic mammal that only eats on frogs, fish, and crabs, which is no idea, but it ends up in our waterways. And you know, we've got a similar one that filled exactly like niches, what they call the native water right here, the Rakali. And that could be, I would love for people to test their Rakalis because they're so low numbers and see maybe they already have um, rat poison in their systems as well, which shows that the rat poison gets it, finds its way into waterways. And then this year, a new publication now out showed in the residential area they actually started testing red cars, pythons, snakes, anything that would consume rats. And all of them have lethal doses of, of rat poison in their system as well. And that's where the downside comes in. You know, now the ecologist in me kicks in and, and people say, oh, you know, you have some collateral damage. But if you if you take a, a you know basic ecology 101, you've got that triangle, your food pyramid, your producers at the bottom, then you've got your consumers. But as you go up on the pyramid, the higher consumers are always low in number and they breed much slower than the feed of the prey they feed on. So rodents are one of these fast breeders. They actually almost a supplier to the upper level. So you kill them, and we've tested this in South Africa on these owls. Um, barn owls that breed fairly quickly, but the spotted eagle owl only breeds once a year and they only have two kills. So if you kill one of them through secondary poisoning, it takes five years to replace that one owl because of this unnatural way of killing it in the population. But the rats, if you kill them, within 42 days, they replace themselves out of the poison, um, you know, and that's what happens. So you pull the upper layer and the bottom layer simply just jumps back and they start breeding more. But the more you kill rat poison you use, the more you pull the upper layer, which means the bottom layer becomes a plague more regularly and bigger and bigger issues. So that's where the downside comes in. So there's this really, and people start to realize this poison is not necessarily the answer. It, you know, over time it, it adds up and it, it creates more problems than solutions. Mm. It's always the case, always in agricultural, you know, systems as well. Resistance keeps growing, then GMO crops, and it just keeps going and going and going. Rather than looking at the causes in the first place, I feel like we always should be looking at cause to disease, to any, any disharmony in the ecosystem. And I think, um, you know, if we allow these predators to build up, wouldn't they be an amazing control of controlling the population of rodents or whatever it is, it's naturally balanced then through the ecosystem. So tell us about so, this, this you know, potential of these owls in actually controlling rodents. So, I mean, we, we've learned, Australia has made plenty of mistakes trying to control a pest by bringing in a predator, cane toads. I mean, that's a typical example. So, Rodents, I mean, I can bring in some caracal and some lynx from Africa, but it will wipe out everything, including my half the population of humans on this, in this continent. So they're very aggressive, but why not have something that's already there? So nature supplied us with this absolute killing machine of rodents. They literally, their whole life, their whole ecology evolved around rodents. And they were here, they're always here, and those are the barn owls. So barn owls occurred not in massive numbers, but because traditionally there weren't that many rodents, but we've introduced so much prey for them. And you know, when you introduce a food source, take the, sorry, take the um, white ibis, for instance, you increase the food source, the population is supposed to explode. So you kind of expect a lot of barn owls. Yes, so, but barn owls, I mean, even their names um, tells you that they're associated with humans. They love where humans go, we, the rats follow us. We bring the rats, the rats follow us, and barn owls, do not give a hoot about vegetation or anything. You've got a structure, they've got a place to hide, and you supply them with food and rats, and they will breed, and they will breed very fast. So this is typically, if you look at it, what the barn owls do, they, they're not even territorial. So like other birds of prey, it's not really successful in controlling rodents because they've got a set breeding time, which is quite often August, September. So when the rat population explodes later, they're out of sync with it. But the barn owl has solved this problem by simply breeding whenever the rats breed, they breed. So there's no set breeding time. To increase the number, 
if there's plenty of food, they don't fight over food, so there's no territory. And you can have, we had in South Africa on one of these grain farms where we tried to solve a solution for them. We put a barn owl box every 100 meters, 75 of them. Two years later, 35 of those 75 were occupied by barn owls. Then my poor students, what we do, and that just gives you an example. So the students would go and harvest it because it all um, um, digests the food, but it, it brings up a pellet. So all the undigested bones and hair get brought up as a pellet. And then the students, we know, we count the chicks in the nest. So there's six chicks in the nest. Then when the chicks um, leave the nest, we go and harvest all those pellets. We dissolve it in water. It's a lovely experiment. And they literally pick up every jawbone. And that way we can tell what species they eat and the number. So it's an estimate. You can't tell the count more. But between the 35 pairs of owls, some of them have nine babies, some of them have three, it all depends on how experienced they are. But on average, we think between 33 and 38,000 rodents is consumed in one year by those pairs. Because we put a camera up on one of the nest boxes that had six chicks in. And in one night, from sunset to sunrise, the parents brought in 49 Prey items into the nest in one hour because the chicks grow so fast. The record we had in a nest, not on that site, but in South Africa, the record was 19 babies in one nest. So the more food there is, the more the female will just keep laying eggs. As soon as the food source dries up, the babies, the weakest ones, don't get enough food, they die back, and the parents stop breeding and they wait for the next season to start with the next exponential growth of the rodents. And that nature supplied us with the rodent control agent. But unfortunately, they're such, it's, I see them as a cheetah of the cat world. They're the cheetah of the, of the night sky. So they're such a super hunter, but they're so lightweight that, you know, any, any poison or anything that, that happens to them, you know, they just cannot make it. They're too lightweight and the dose just kills them. And they've got to be really fast. So I'm jumping on to the, the poison. There are some poisons that they say is bird friendly. And if you read the fine print, it says it makes owl sick. It doesn't kill them, which is true. They don't lie. But I, as a wildlife carer, get so many of these owls. And so what happens, and this is what happened um, with Professor Luke Ling from Gatton University has got a master's or a PhD student onto this at the Sunshine Coast. They found that they all of a sudden had all these roadkill of barn owls on the Bruce Highway. And they couldn't figure out why do you get roadkill of, why does barn owls get hit on the highway? And they tested, so what they did in the sugarcane industry, they used this poison that doesn't kill owls but make them sick because they try to control the cane rats that's in the sugarcane. And what they found is that it makes the owl sick, so he's got to sit and wait for this poison to go through his system. So for four or five days, they just sit like this. They've got a fever and they just feel miserable. They literally just sit and shake like this, but they can work it out. The problem is they can't carry any fat reserves. They're super hunted. So four or five days of no food, and you have a very fit rat, they can't catch the rats anymore. So they've moved onto the Bruce Highway to live off carrion or road field to stay alive, and that's when they get hit. And that's unfortunately what we found. If we do manage to save them, they do, you know, the poison, it, it goes through their system and they get healthy as long as you just keep feeding them. But it, it's so, the one kills them in a terrible way, but probably fast. The other one doesn't kill them, but it makes them starve to death. But it still has a terrible impact on the barn owls. And that's where, where the issue comes in. And barn owls, they in London, in the middle of cities. You find barn owls in New York, you find them in cities that love human habitat. We are supposed to have so many owls in this city, in all the cities. Just supply them with a nest box and stop poisoning them and their numbers. And what's nice is they bounce back so quickly because they breathe very fast. Mm. It's just they, they cannot, the population cannot recover because we keep knocking them down. Mm. And, and the perfect time, Sandra, to have this discussion because winter is the time when the rodents get cold. There's no food and they move into residential areas. That's the time when people start putting poison on. And fortunately, winter is also the main time when owls breed. And because they need to breed in winter when the night hours are the longest. So in some of the night hours, they're too short for them to feed their chicks. So they need maximum hunt hunting time. And that's in the middle of winter. And that's when they get killed by the poison. So it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's probably a collection of, of bad luck for the, for the birds of prey, the nocturnal birds of prey. 
Yes, and when and when you knock down, knock out the predators, that's when things really get full on, doesn't it? Like ecologically, like getting rid of the dingoes, all these animals that are needing to be there, and owls and snakes and all these animals that are predatory, we need them in the ecosystem so much. And I feel like I we just don't let nature do its thing because we're introducing all these control measures that are just not ecologically sound and as you say they don't make sense because not it just keeps going it just gets worse there's resistance then there's you know harder drugs harder chemicals and it just never solves the problem and we're losing an entire ecosystem even waters get poisoned as you say so i feel like this is so essential for people to know right now you know um especially like right now that there's this possibility of changing the laws in australia around this so I think we're going to put this presentation up first before anything else goes out after we speak, because I feel like, wow, we need to do something. <laughs> uh, tell us more about these beautiful owls. Like, they're worldwide spread, aren't they? Um, and you said there will be. Tell us more about them, because they are the heroes here. <laughs> well, so you get a few subspecies. You get the ones from America. You get the ones in Europe. You get the ones in Asia and then the one in Australia as a subspecies as well. But they they all behave and do exactly the same thing. So they they just this lightweight owl, they they have two requirements. And like other owls that only use a hollow to, to nest in and to breed in, these owls, because they're so lightweight, unfortunately in nature, you know, it's also if a bigger owl sees them, they will hunt them and eat them. So even the chicks of these are very high mortality of barn owl chicks. Because when they start to hunt, they're inexperienced and other owls will even hunt them and eat them. So there's this competition, which is nature. But they need to hide, so they, they're a very nervous owl. And they need to, you know, again, like I say, it's almost like the cheetahs in Africa. You see a little fox, or we have jackal. Jackal chase a, a cheetah away from a field because they can't afford to be hurt or be injured. So they, they're really lightweight, and these owls are the same. They lightweight, they... The, the whole face is designed to hear. They reckon, I've loved this one where David Attenborough's done it in a, in a, in a shed in, in the UK. We take zero light and they put infrared cameras in and they let a mouse run. And over 20 meters, he picks the mouse to a distance of uh, a deviation of about one and a half centimeters, but he still gets in as soon as the mouse with zero sight because all he does, he's got three dimensional hearing. And they reckon he can hear a mouse heartbeat in, in the distance of about 20 meters. So the, the rats cannot adapt. While if we use poison, the rats learn. And this is where the problem comes in, where people don't realize. Professor Lukling has proved this, that when you use a poison, the adults, the breeders, don't touch that poison. They've learned. It's bad. We will not touch that poison. So you only kill the next, the young ones. And then the population drops. But, and this is why, and this is exactly at our depot it happened. A few years ago, we would use a lot of poison here because we've got chips, we've got bird seed, we've got a nursery, so they, they eat nuts and they eat all our plant seeds and things. So people would put poison on, like most people do. But every three months we have this play. So it drops, we find dead rats all over, and then it starts again. And I said, we've got to stop this. It was the challenge to get the, the old school to accept this. But you know what? We stopped, we threw away all the rat bait stations, got rid of all the poison, and to date, that's just now two years, we've not had one single rat bait that have numbers increased because we've got chooks. So the chooks tell you very quickly if there's a problem because you see the rats in the chook thing. They, we still have them in low numbers. So that's the point is you, because what happens as soon as you kill the, the, the rat poison, it kills the young ones, stupid, the young, inexperienced ones, but it always leaves a few of those young ones that survive the poison, but they then become immune and they stop breeding. They will not catch that poison. So every time you use poison, you create a smaller, a, a slightly bigger population that won't eat it, and they then replace themselves. And this is an experiment. So they've done with the brown rat in, in um, National Geographic, they need in America. If you take the brown rat, they normally have 10 babies in a, in a litter. As soon as you start removing them, all the population, or you take, you force the population to crash. They increase their litter size to 18. And this is what the poison does. Because you crush the population, those adult breeders that don't touch the poison replace themselves because they even increase their litter size to 18 babies in one litter. So, and that's why it does these spikes all the time. And every time you use poison, you kill one of their predators, which means the spike just 
bigger and bigger and not doing this. So at the moment, we have stopped using poison and it's literally doing this and there's no spike in there. Mm. Low population, no damage in a the, in the really low spike. And that's, that's where, and these owls are brilliant in finding those rats because that's why I started with the story. Rats learn to avoid whatever we throw at them, but they cannot avoid a super predator because a predator adapts to their behavior. Mm. So as he changes his behavior, the predator adapts. And they have a perfect control method machine. And I just love, I mean, I love rats. Rats are so intelligent and so beautiful as an animal as well when you get to know them. Unfortunately, a lot of the times I have gotten to know them when they're on their deathbed because at work, you know, the poison would have been used and I'm the one finding these animals and then you have to kill them. And it's, it's because they're dying for six days, as you say, you know, like it's, and they're so, so amazing. I mean, we could just learn to love them and yes, um, learn how to let, let nature take care of it. You know, they're already here, they're part of the ecosystem and they're great food source for many animals when they're not poisoned. So, well, let's just embrace them. <laughs> I mean, if they, 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 I must admit they become a nuisance when they come into your house and they chew to do things. But you know that, that's what I point I made is we have, they still get into our nursery. We try to grow, for instance, I try to grow macadamias and the rats are so clever. They don't touch the macadamia until the nut cracks open for the seed to germinate and then they eat it. So they wait for me to crack it for them or nature and then they eat it. So what we do is we put a rat trap out in our cage and we trap that individual one. So you, you remove the individual that's causing the problem, not go indiscriminate and kill all of it. And that is why the population stays stable. So we trap there every now and again. We do trap a rat here, but in a cage. I euthanize them, they go into a freezer, and I've got a friend that uh, does raptor rehabilitation. And these all go in a freezer to her because she, you know, she has powerful owls. She's got, I think this year she had over 25 rubric owls just in care. Um, so these is a good use, but we know we don't use any poison, so it's safe to get, uh, give it to them. You found some incredible also in your presentation, I remember. Um some experiments you did. I can't remember the name of the organization you worked with or were they just having a look through your slides. Uh, Inga, Inga Barn Owl Project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So this is one of those. So, I mean, Ingham's is a chicken factory and, and this is now where we need to change the legislation. So this is the perfect time to talk about it. So there's the health and environment officer asked us to do a project around the neighboring onto them are these massive artificial dams. So we put corner cameras up and we found lots of bandicoots and a lot of rats. And then we found a barn owl pellets and then we found a dead barn owl. But Ingham's is a food supplier of human food. So they by law have to have a rat bait station 10 meters away from the building all around the edge every three meters. Every three meters there's got to be a rat bait station. And by law they're not allowed to remove it. And this is when what we started then is putting a post for barn owls away from that. It's far on the property but it's far away from that so we offer them a home which is just a post with a box in that they can hide it. And then I've taken grain pipes and I've cut holes in them and I feed it, fill it with sunflower seed on the opposite side. So we offer them an alternative to poison and that's a sunflower seed and it, it, it cracks into a point we whip a snip of clearing and the owls just you know it makes them more vulnerable to predation as well and that's what we did there to but unfortunately as much as we'd love and again you know i spoke about the rakali he just phoned me today and said i've got a video of a uh, rakali swimming in one of the ponds right next to the property but you know rat poison every three meters by law he can't change it he wants to but he says he can't so maybe it's time to look at legislation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, sure. I think because, you know, the more education there is, also people are going to be naturally not wanting to use these things. And I know it's harder at an industry level like farming, but at least if we start doing that, you know, in homes and in cities, it will really change things because eventually people, I know it's a slow process, but people will start going, no, like that was something of the past, you know, like racism or whatever. Those things slowly come out of the mm -hmm. hist history of human race and us being on, on the planet, you know. And, um, and I just think, yeah, any experiments, you know, anything like this in our own homes, installing a, 
this is one thing I want to do. I want to get a barn owl, <laughs> you know. How, how do we go about it? What can we do to increase the habitat and the breeding um, of these magnificent animals just because they're amazing, not just because they're hunters of rodents? <laughs> Even that, you know, um, I was fortunate and I okay, told the story about barn owls to one of the guys that supplies with Biboos, which is um, bacillus bacteria that we use in our planting. So we inoculate the soil with natural bacteria, which you might like. I mean, that's what your, your speciality is. But he also supplies this to the macadamia farmers in the Sunshine Coast. And there's a whole group of macadamia farmers. And as I mentioned, macadamia is, is one of the favorite food source for rodents. But they export their macadamia. So they have an issue because of rodents. So they put barn owl boxes up. And he phoned me and he said, within six days, they had a barn owl in the first box. So that shows that they were there, but now they've removed all the rat poison in the um, under the macadamia trees. And then when they get population there, they would start putting nest boxes on their shed and their packing shed and remove all poison. So it can happen even in agriculture. Especially when you want to do export, you know, with this, you, you, you've got to be audited and nobody can use, you know, the, you can't just use chemicals in mm. And this farmers have found this way of doing that using those um, barn oil boxes instead of rat poison. And they say it looks like it's working. So I haven't had feedback from them, but they said the first barn oil moved into the box and they were so excited. It's six families that came together to make it. So, uh, What's nicer than to, to see barn owls in your property and you know you're doing something for the environment and not poisoning the environment? Mm, definitely. And not to mention, like I forgot to also mention um, in your presentation, there's a statistic that, what is it, 10,000 children um, have access or get poisoned by um, rodent poisons? I mean, because it's just in America, but you know, you've got to bear in mind that America's got a massive population. But it is 10,000 children, 80, and uh, 300 and something died last year of poison. 349 died of, of rat poison because it, it's, it tastes like bubble gum and it smells like bubble gum. So they've now in Australia, or they put a bittering agent into it, but still, I mean, your dog would not eat it, but they love it because even that bitter taste doesn't stop them from eating it. So, um, and unfortunately, it's, if, you, if you leave it and it's indiscriminate put on, or to them it's, you know, a blue NMM, MMM and a, and a piece of, of rat bait, they will put it in the mouth and start eating it. And yeah. put it on. And with this second generation, it's so strong. The second generation toxin is really strong. So you need much less of it to, to, to even kill a child. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, I very, I very feel I feel very strongly about poisons of any kind. I mean, the environment in our bodies or anywhere because I've seen the effects. I've worked with, um, you know, some <laughs> some things that um, were poisonous and watched how nature reacts and fights back and decomposes. And so, if we just stop doing it, you know, nature will take care of it. Especially the soil microbes, as you said, um, uh, early mentioned microbes earlier. Uh, if we were old to just go and get a, what kind of, first of all, what kind of a box does a barn owl really need? Now, and also let us know about, like, if every household had one, what would happen? Would it just create home for other animals as well? Because I'm assuming they've got some range as well. And the amount of food will limit how, you know, how they nest and where they nest. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So, like I mentioned, the barn owls, they will only breed if the food population increase, you know, the food, the rodent population increase. So you will have maybe a pair of barn owls and they eat one, each adult owl will eat one rat a night. And if it's a big rat, they will eat only a second night. Until, and we don't understand how they, they can't figure out, they think it's because as soon as the, the rodents start, numbers increase, it's either young ones or there must be something in the females that start getting ready to have babies but it triggers the female barn owl to get into breeding conditions. So she almost lays her first eggs literally weeks after the population starts increasing. They don't know how they figure it out. Or that it's just because they only need one to eat. It. But she goes into breeding and then the more food there is, the more eggs she will just keep laying. She will just keep laying and they all staggered. So you'll have one that's nearly ready to leave the nest and a tiny one. Because if you've got six babies and they, to give you an idea, when I do bird care and I have an adult, barn owl, I can feed him one rat and up, and then he would not even, because they care, so they don't burn energy by flying, 
So you'd eat one and then every second or third day you'd skip a meal. If I have babies, tiny ones, they go to between six and 11 rats per night, each one of them, each by night. That's the amount of food they consume because they grow so fast. They're extremely fast growing. So they need a lot of protein. For that. So if you put a barn owl box up, so the barn owls just need a box that's closed up. And if you go into Google, you can see Google barn owl box. There's any possible design. You know, these blue containers that you buy at Bunnings, there's plastic drums. There's one where a photo in America where they put it inside a barn. They cut a hole in, put some wood chip in it, and the barn owls moved in within a week and they had eggs within 30 days. That's just a drum that's on the inside. They will take anything where they can hide and stay safe. It doesn't have to be a lock. It can be any shape as long as they just can hide. In, in traditionally in farms where you pack all your um, lucerne and things up to the roof, they even breed between the lucerne. And that's why quite often when in the winter when the carers get baby barnacles because the farmers start removing the lucerne to feed and the, the hay to feed their cattle. And then they just see baby barnacles fall out between these barns because they literally breed in the gap between those. So they're very specific, you know, very generous in where they breed as long as it's a safe spot. I say if you put in a tree, you're most likely going to find a possum. Unfortunately, so what we've done in our poles where we put it up, we put a possum guard, which is literally a thick piece of plastic that I bought at Bunnings, and I put it at the bottom because the possum slides and you can't get up on, and that keeps the possum out of it. And then just put it up and wait for the, the you know, if there's an owl, it might take a month, it might take two years, but it's working. The more boxes we put up, the more owls we put up. To answer your question, we've had it in, in farm, obviously, with lots of rodents, and the barn owls breed on the one side. We put a box on the other side of the building and the offspring move to the other side because they're not territorial the parents don't chase them they just move to the next available hollow and there they breed and they mix up so literally you can increase the population so high as long as there's enough food if there's not enough food either the strong ones start moving away to look for food or they're really inexperienced juveniles to die out in the population crash. And, and that's what nature is you know you, you can't imbalance it by letting nature just do its job they will balance itself out it's when we interfere that we can put all these imbalances into the system. So did you say they're not territorial? So they just basically... No. Uh, yeah, that's incredible. And where... Would they be distributed yes. everywhere around Australia? Like, I live out in the country. Would they be here as well? Yes, they will be there. The thing is that the problem with barn owls, it's almost like when I say with gliders, you know, I've done a lot of work with school gliders. It's not like a koala that sits in a tree and you walk during the day and you're there, you see a koala and a, and a tree fork half asleep. Barn owls don't sit in a tree. They sleep somewhere where nobody can see them. They crawl into the deepest holes so people don't see them during the day. At night, they don't sit on a roof or in a tree crawling because they don't have a very pretty boo hoo call. They've got a screeching sound, which is horrendous because they don't really, you know, people don't realize, but owls don't call because they feel like singing. Owls call because they need to find a mate or to advertise a territory. But they're not territorial, so they are not blessed with a, a very pretty voice. It's a horrendous voice. It puts fear in every rat if you hear it. It sounds like when you take your nails and you scratch on the whiteboard, chalkboard, <laughs> listen to barn owl calls. It gives you the creeps. But the people don't hear it very quiet, and they wait. They will not come out until it's pitch black off. Mm. So... People don't know that they are, but they are everywhere. There's, there's plenty of them, you know, in, in the residential areas, um, in, in, in Ipswich, and in, like I say, Ingham's is right next to the gateway, and that's where they are. People say, oh, there they are, barn owls, or something. Put the camera, within weeks we had the barn owls occupying one of the boxes. Are there special cameras? My friend asked me because she wants to install cam a camera, a wildlife camera. What sort of cameras would you recommend for if you wanted to do a project and actually see the barn owls because, you know, you're not going to wake up in the middle of the night? Um, is there uh, something you could recommend so people could do, like build a nice habitat for them and then install a camera to view them? It's, it sounds odd, but you know what I do is, is if you want to see the they obviously you put your nest box up and then you in the camera. So LD sells these cameras for, I think, $40 or $100. Um, they work very well. Um, you get, and, and luckily, it's almost like computers. The more technology goes on, the better it gets and the cheaper it gets. So the first cameras we bought with grants, and they were almost $900. Those are the really high-tech ones, and they're down now to $500. Um, 
Um, but you can get a camera for hundred dollars, a Fauna camera, and they work brilliant. Once at Aldi, they really and Bunnings, Pinty Bunnings also sells now Fauna cameras for a really low price. And it's just, I mean, you're not going to turn it into science publications just to see what's in there. And then if you if you're not sure and you don't get any activity, do yourself a favor and just do what I do: take a grain pot, make some holes in it, put some sunflower seed out, and you lure them out, and you quickly see what comes to that because it's Birds of prey, just it's amazing. I live in I live in Petrie in, in the middle of town, and I've got a public owl in my garden now. And it's the same thing because I refuse to use rat poison. And if there's a rat, because I breed quails, I check a trap and I catch him, end of story. As soon as you use poison, you get constant rats coming in. Yeah. And yeah. life is there. I when I arrived here, or I'm a bit off the topic, but when I arrived here from South Africa, I said, Australia is so blessed. In Africa, wildlife does not do well with people. Probably because people were there for so long and it evolved with it. So people, a human was always a predator to wildlife and they move away. So they don't do well with any human activity. They live on the outskirts of town. But here, wildlife lives with people. They tolerate people. It's just, you know, you've got a great habitat for them and they live in between them. And happens in the middle of town, in the middle of city, possums everywhere. Wallabies, they, they hide in the smallest little creek, um, bandicoots, so they, they're here. We've just got to allow them to survive. Yeah. Do, do the yeah. owls I mean, owls feed also on um, other animals besides, I mean, rodents, you said, are their specialty, but what else will they eat, like antichinus, even though there's probably no antichinus? That's another thing I remember you talking about in this presentation you gave, that the rat poison also eliminates um, some of the native species of rodents that we have, isn't that? that they reckon that um, first they always blame the antichinus, uh, the cat population, domestic and feral cats in cities, domestic cats in cities or suburbia, for the demise of antichinus. And then they did some studies and they reckon the ones that they did find had all high percentage of rat poison. So, and they can fit into these bait stations. And they reckon that the cat was there to bring the population down, but the last nail in the coffin was the rat poison. That, that what the enterprises are in, in, in big cities. Because they also can live. I mean, they can live anywhere. They, they need such a small little habitat. And they are such a generous feeder. Um, I think it's, it's, it's literally the rat poison was the last thing that broke the comments back to me and they disappeared from, from me. Was, we put boxes up all over the place and we found only the generous thing. You know, Basket girls are born. All, everything has disappeared. And, and it's slowly, it's, it's almost like this, the slow washout of diversity. And that's when the, you know, the exotics take hold, because that's proof if you, your exotics take over when you have a decline in, in diversity, because you create vacuums for them to, to occupy. Ah. So bring back the barn and, and, and get that system going. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. so they basically will feed on other things. So if they bring out, like any population of any small mammals, they will hunt, right? But that will also keep populations sort of um, at balance naturally and they will just eat as much as there's availability of that. Is that correct? That's correct. So you see, because I've mentioned the barn owl is really, we found that they would eat, they would eat the odd bird and things that sit out and outside and eat, but more than 97% of their food consists of rodents, small mammals, but that could be native mammals as well and it's got to be terrestrial not a boreal they can't hunt in the air so they can't take a squirrel glider out like a bubuk owl or a barking owl or a powerful owl can they've got to be on the ground um anything that moves at night um and that's why the population at the moment we have low numbers hanging out in the natural bushland because there's not enough food for them because there's not a lot of no there's native rats but those occur in low numbers so the owl population is low they want to come into the city where all the food is, and that's where the exotic rats are, which is these population explosions. So they would love, they always just hang out in low numbers on the edge. As soon as we stop, and they always try to come in. So the barn owls we see are these ones that come in for the food, but they don't survive the poison, and they die out. So that's why the, the vacuum, we, we maintain that vacuum, and the rodents just love it. We stop that, they would fill that vacuum and basically start moving into suburbia with boxes, 
because they like humans. They love human habitat, while all other birds tend to don't like twisters. They love it. The more we change it, they don't give a damn as long as they have a place to hide and find rats. And rats are everywhere, and they will fly. That is so cool. So basically what we've got to do is right now, everyone, get rid of your poison safely somehow. Don't know how you get rid of it safely. <laughs> um, and then you install an um, bow up. Barn album. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then watch the rats disappear and the barn owls fly in the middle of the night. We really need to do this. So, I'm excited. <laughs> if the barn owl is not going to appear overnight, but if your population of rodents do increase because you've destabilized it, just use a, buy a rat trap. And if you don't want to euthanize it, go and send it to your vet and ask them to euthanize the exotic rat. And at least they can identify because sometimes people do catch native rats in their traps and they don't know the difference. So at least somebody that can identify you, make sure that it's an exotic. And that will stabilize the population and then you are also moving. in. They are. They are, you know, in suburbia, especially where we've got wetland areas, because the brown rat, exotic brown rat, loves wet areas. And they love hanging around those wet areas. The barn owls, that's where we found them. So we've got to just get populations, start them, and, and the population will increase. And it's not like we're trying to increase the population of elephants that take 20 years to have their first calf or something. These things will breed instantly, and we will see the results. Just stop killing them with poison. Yeah. And so can I ask, if we were to catch a rat, I mean, I live in the bush anyway, but I did have a rat problem once. Um, I could never catch them. I was making my own traps and stuff. <laughs> Um, they're gone now. I don't know where they've gone. <laughs> uh, but if you release them into the bush areas, like if you just caught a live rat and you weren't sure if it's a, um, a native rat or an introduced rat, could you release them into nature? Because they don't thrive as much, do they? They're really just like, they're just with us. They kind of love us, don't they? They love our habitats, the food we give them. Yeah. So if you were to release them, like, the owl would just grab it, right? Owls, or even you know, in, in bushland, you still have your pythons. You still have all the different snakes, and um, brown snakes, and and red bellies that love hunting them. So they will take them out. And especially, especially if there's not a lot of food, and especially if they come from the city, they probably lift off McDonald's and things. So they're slightly overweight and a bit slow. So they make a good meal for a native a snake or something in the bush. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So that's that's the rat problem solved. And now we're just going to get more barn owls. You're going to give a presentation on Wednesday, aren't you, um, online for people to join for free. Tell us a little bit more about this presentation. It's just basically we're going to do very much what we discussed today, um, just trying to get the message out there. Now, obviously, uh, the people that have where I have shared it on the owl groups, there are some real high-tech science scientists. That's really promoting and, and trying to push for this and, and show the science how this rat poison is finding its way into the system and into our environment. And they're trying to push for it to, to make people aware of it. So I, I know there's one or two of them that said they're going to join. So there's, I'm no expert on the poison. I'm not a, a biochemist. And I think these guys are biochemists that really know this stuff. And, and this is just to, to raise awareness. So it's free. It's a Zoom. You've got to just do a buy a ticket on Eventbrite. If not buy, you can book a ticket. And I think there's already 35 people. That, and it's going to be a Zoom discussion. And people can share the, the information and um, we'll record it and we'll share it again. So it's just to, to basically to raise awareness. While everybody's in lockdown, it, it's, a, it's a clever way with a Zoom just to, to reach more people. Absolutely. So you said it's quite easy to build habitat for barn owls. So it's quite easy to, you're going to probably show that in your presentation as well, like how to make a box. But as you said, if people just Google how to, um, oh, yes. then, yeah, it's yeah. quite easy. Is there a height, specific height it's got to be uh, installed at once it's um, made? The rule for me is when you have a box and you can see into the box, to the back of the box, it's either too low or too shallow. Barn owl really needs a dark, dark spot where nobody can see. So the bigger the box, the better, because the more chicks they will have. You know, if there's a lot of food, they might have six or seven chicks in it. So they need that space. And put it as high. I always try and tell people if it's against your house, put it against your house at the top knock where the, the roof comes in there, because that's where you can prevent possums from occupying it. 
and the Barnals, we just, they, they found it because wherever they, they, they come to residential areas because they, they know that's where the rats are. They can hear them, they can see them, and they're coming to, to suburbia to hunt the rats. Um, and pretty soon, and quite often at the moment, they come in, they feed, and then they've got to fly out to a hollow in a tree that's in a bushland quite far, and they don't really, they're not long distance flies. Mm -hmm. So they will very quickly, if you've got rodents, it's amazing. If you've got a barn owl in a bushland next to you, and you've got rodents, and you put a box up, I can almost guarantee you, you'll have that barn owl occupy that box within 30 days, easily. Mm -hmm. Cool. Because there is such a low of hiding spots yeah that's really cool stefan like i'm so excited um just excited to hear about this again and um yeah and i hope that this message really gets out there to people so i'll do my best to make that happen we'll share it on our social media with fordia and i'm sure it will spread like wildfire um but thank you so much for your time for doing this for speaking to us it's a pleasure having you on the show <laughs> Uh, and um, and I hope to speak to you actually more later on also about um, just your exciting other things that you've done, like work with chimpanzees and stuff. So hopefully one day we can catch up on another subject because you seem to have a lot of um, info on animals and we all love animals, I think. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but um, thanks so much. Hey, like it's really a great pleasure to hear all this great stuff, great science and this um, possibility of changing the world with this whole rat poison thing and... Uh, like you've mentioned, I work for Belimba Creek Catchment. We're a community group, not for profit. And we, you know, we share information. So if people want to Google our, our website, contact me. Um, all our details is on our website, Belimba Creek Catchment. Yeah. And we're happy to answer questions if there are any. Yeah. Or even suggestions. You know, we learn more. If somebody comes and says, oh, I've tried this. This is how we learn more. Yeah. Um, that's the way to do it. Well, thanks so very much once more. And um, yeah, and I hopefully we'll catch up with you when things are a little bit less um, hectic or more hectic. Yeah. <laughs> Actually. So, so then distancing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I definitely would love to set up a box at Wood Fortier as well. So maybe next time we have a tree hugger meeting again, we could probably experiment with setting one up and we'll yeah. be in touch after that. <laughs> thanks so yeah. much, Stefan. All the best. Bye. See you guys. Thanks bye for bye. listening. Bye.